The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Well, good night. It's another Duke's Court. I'm here tonight with Chris, the Mud Pie Man Fletcher, Gary, the Toolmaker Ken, and I'm Dave Tough Nut Finoli. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Tough Nuts. <laughs> I, I need I need to hear the story behind this nickname. <laughs> you know, I'm, uh, <laughs> I, I could say I could say several things. Yeah, you go. <laughs> but we all I was a little bored players. watching a soccer game this afternoon, and I came across a nickname uh, uh, website. And I thought to myself, if I had ever given uh, myself a nickname other than the nose, it'd be tough not. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, I, I, I believe. I believe. Well, you, you were going to be the stacker of wheat, Fletch, but, uh, you know, we decided to go this way in, in, instead. You'll have to share that site with us some. Oh. <laughs> I will weekly. I will weekly. Oh, Fletch. that's beautiful. <laughs> well, you know, we're, we're getting towards the end of uh, the baseball season. And um, who would have thought at this point in time the Pirates would have a better percentage record than the Steelers? I would not have made that gamble myself, but um, they certainly have developed a nice pitching staff down the uh, stretch, but unfortunately um, didn't. Uh, uh, the second half hasn't gone the way they've hoped, and, and they have no playoff spot, uh, spot in, but... Um, we're going to talk about the teams that uh, that do have a spot in the playoffs today. Um, I think uh, uh, I think we can all agree the American League is pretty set. Uh, Boston uh, has, uh, I, I believe, uh, uh, tonight can clinch the uh, the East, but uh, it's pretty much all done. Cleveland has clinched the Central. Uh, Houston has a little little uh, distance on Oakland and, and has started to play the way the Astros play. And the Yanks and Oakland are pretty much uh, looking like uh, the wild card. Um, in the NL, uh, Atlanta has now gotten a little bit of a comfortable lead, and um, they will be the, uh, the the NL East champion. Um, Milwaukee threw a little bit of, of a scare into Chicago, but I'm, I'm still going to uh, stick with Chicago uh, holding on to the Central. Um, in the uh, in the West, uh, the Dodgers and, and Rocks are uh, uh, pretty much in a neck and neck battle, which should be exciting. And, and all three are in a battle with St. Louis for that last spot. But St. Louis has fallen off, uh, and um, I really think the Dodgers are, are playing the best ball at this point in the National League. Um, I'm going to make the claim they will they will go to the uh, World Series. But gentlemen, I'm going to say that. No National League uh, team has a shot at, at this point at, at a World Series uh, championship. Um, looking over the stats today, um, the five uh, best offensive teams in baseball are the five teams going to the American League uh, um, playoffs. And, and the thing that I find interesting about these teams is there's seemingly only one uh, position on each of them that, that has a lack of power. Um, they, they're all powerful teams, um, all spread out. You look at the A's, led by uh, Chris Davis's 43 homers. Um, everybody has double-digit homers. One, two, three, four, five players have over 20. Um, so you have good uh, good depth there. Um, you look at the Astros. Uh, only at catcher do they uh, uh, not have uh, real home run power. Other than that. Um, I mean, first base, they, they lack a little bit, but everybody has double-digit home run uh, capabilities there. Um, you go to um, uh, the Red Sox, and again, same thing, consistent, good home run power. Catcher is the only, only place that really uh, uh, has no threat, but, um, you know, uh, they, they, to me, have the, the best duo in Betts and Martinez, uh, right now the best duo of hitters in, in baseball. And then the Yankees. Um, everybody. Uh, they have ten players who have t- double-digit home runs. They have one, two, three, four, five, six players with over 20. Um, very consistent, very dangerous. So you tend to look down and, and 
and see in that group who has who has the best pitching. Who is who is the team that uh, um, is going to be most apt to stop that consistent hitting? And, and it just they just incredible how each of those teams is, is very close in run scored. Each of those teams very close offensively. Each of those teams ha- have consistent power. Um, I mean, heads and tails, the best starting rotation in the American League, and in baseball is, is the Astros. Um, Morton and Cole have cooled off a little since their um, their early uh, early success, but they're still having great years. Uh, Verlander has just been pretty much lights out all year. Um, Ketchel has started to uh, uh, pitch well after a, a tough start, um, and the bullpen's pretty solid, but. To me, I'm going to make a surprising claim here. There's going to be one team that could challenge them, and it looks like Chapman will be back for the end of um, the end of uh, the season, which originally I thought he wasn't going to be back. And um, Jay Happ has, has done a real good job um, uh, since he's uh, uh, been uh, acquired from Toronto, and and that gives them three really solid starters. Um, Gives them a bullpen with Chapman in there that that pretty much is probably the best in baseball, and you also have, as I said, a very consistent uh, very consistent lineup. So I'm going to say the um, the Yanks uh, right now. I'm going to put the with the Astros playing as well as they are. Uh, I'm going to put them back in 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 the uh, uh, favorite role um, with that starting pitching. I'm going to put the Yankees as the upset special. I think. Uh, uh, maybe the Indians. Uh, uh, I'm not really sold on the fact that Miller's going to come back 100%, and I, I just think, unfortunately, that's going to be uh, be their uh, their bugaboo at the end. But uh, um, you know, overall, those are those are the teams I would be looking for. Um, uh, the four teams I would be looking for in the um, um, in the final four at this point. Um, Gary, what do you think uh, as you so, see things? Dave, just to make sure, so you're saying uh, Houston, Yankees, yeah. ALCS, and yeah. L.A., and who, Chicago? And Chicago at this point. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's funny. I'm, I'm fairly similar. It's funny. You know, the, the AL, to me, is going to be a fascinating um, situation. And what I mean by that is um, – yeah, you think about it, I mean, one very, very good team is probably going to go out first. And I'm still, believe it or not, I'm still a little bit confused about these wild card rules, but I believe the winner of Oakland and the Yankees would play Boston, correct? They would. They would, yes. Right. So when you think about it, I mean, to me, the teams that have the best balance, even with Miller being a big question mark and probably not likely the way it looks, you know, right. Looking at the statistics, he hasn't pitched forever. But, I mean, Hand, as Fletch indicated a couple of weeks ago, was a tremendous pickup. Now, he's not as dominant as Miller, but he right. can certainly get both sides of the plate out. But, um, you know, Allen's been pretty damn good. I mean, he's only got 29 saves. He's been pretty damn good here most of the season. So, you know, and Fran cohen has got a lot of postseason experience. But one very good team is probably going to go out in that series. And to me, you know, that's one of the teams that I think very strongly could go on to the World Series. And and the reason I say this because I mean Boston, yeah, Martinez had a fantastic year, Betts has had a fantastic year, but Betts can't throw the ball if you watch the highlights yesterday. So right. I mean something's not right with him. I mean that Boston team has stunned everybody all year long. The sale, big questions. You know, is he going to be able to go? I mean he came right. back, he didn't look quite right. Porcello, Porcello is not the twenty and four he was a couple years ago. He's at four sixty nine. I know that park drives your era up, but he hasn't been the same pitcher since he was two years ago, even this year. You know, yeah. I mean, Price and, and, and is, it, uh, is it Rodriguez have been pretty much the same pitcher. Right. Price hasn't been a great postseason pitcher. I just have a feeling they're going to get dumped. I mean, I think I, the wild card game is going to be fascinating. I mean, yeah. I think they're, they're both similar teams. You're right, Dave. They both hit the ball in the park. They both strike out a lot. The A's got a ton of problems in the uh, rotation now with Vanaya being out for the rest of the year and everything else. You know, I think they're going to, I think they might make us all puke as purists if we're all that because I have a feeling they're going to go with that opener 
And then, you know, they got four closers like we talked about a couple weeks ago. Now they used Hendricks, I saw yesterday, to pitch a couple innings to start. They might go with an opener and then go with one of these average arms at best and fires Jackson or somebody else, you know, innings three, four, five. And then they'll run those guys out there if they have a 2 nothing lead with a couple home runs from Davis and Olsen or something. You know, and, and that, yeah, that, 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 this wild card game, which I think is a contrived, you know, interest raiser, but this year that wild card game, if they meet, whether it's in New York or Oakland, is going to be fascinating because it's going to be interesting to see what both teams do. And I think either one of them coming out of that are going to play Boston. And I think Boston's coming into this a little bit vulnerable. As good as they've been, all these wins, that kind of stuff, you know, I mean, I, they don't strike out as much as some of these other teams, but I have a feeling that, that that's going to be incredible drama, and one team is going to go out early, Cleveland and Houston, that to me, on its face, with those pitching staffs, those starting pitching staffs, and very, very good teams, very, very good players at most positions, with all, and, and including all the power. One of those teams who I would have normally picked to start the year to go to the World Series could go out. Now, the only converse I have to you, Dave, is, you know, it's hard to get back. There's not a lot of teams that go back to the World Series two years in a row. Right. And I do like Houston in that series versus, or rather, versus, or Houston versus Cleveland. But, I mean, Cleveland starting pitching is pretty good. And, I mean, some of these guys have been good postseason players like Lindor and some of these other guys. I mean, they may not be as sexy on the, on the, on the national media as Correa and Altuve and some of those guys, but that's a pretty damn good Indian team. So I, I don't really know who's going to come out of that, but if you had to tell me today, there's just a gut feeling I have that Cleveland might nose them out in that series. And I agree, whoever the winner is of Oakland and the Yankees dumps the Red Sox. I have a feeling it's going to be the Yankees. I mean, I do, I, I do think that they're coming into this rotation-wise a little bit healthier with a little bit more proven bullpen, particularly if Chapman can go versus Trinan at the end of the game. I have a feeling we're going to see Yankees and Cleveland again, not this time in the second round, but in the final round in the AL. Right. In the NL, you know, as much as I've liked the way Atlanta's played, particularly with those rookies, that bullpen is, is weak. That starting staff, if Fulton Evich is your number one, I mean, I like, the, I like the guy. He's got a big arm. I'm not really sure, though, that they're going to be able they, – they may end up playing – ironically, if Colorado wins the West, they may end up playing the Rockies first. Right. And the Dodgers may end up playing the Cubs, which would scuttle what your thought was about the Dodgers and the Cubs coming out of that. I mean, right. you know, the way the Dodgers played this weekend – I mean, you might you might fall in love with them again, but you know, for every time they've done that this year, then they've slipped back into a 14 strikeout game, you know, with uh, with uh, you know with with losing two to one. I mean, I do think that right now, if Jansen can go and he doesn't have any health problems, if you can get to him, which is going to be the Dodgers' issue, the Dodgers should, you know, play in the NLCS again, but. I don't know. They've had a lot of problems getting to him, and he hasn't been as dependable this year as he's been in the past. And he's kind of like Rivera. Rivera got through all those years with that one pitch, uh, and he got through it. Jansen's done that a number of years, too. This year he's given up a lot of home runs and a lot of lost a lot of games in big situations. So I'm not as comfortable that they're going to come out of it. But I'm not even, I'm not even sure they're going to win the, the NL West. I mean, they played average against Colorado this year. In that park, you never know what's going to happen. Um, you know, if, if, if you said to me, well, give me a lineup that's got LeMayhew, Story, Blackman, you know, those guys versus the Dodger lineup, even as loaded as it is with all these pickups at the deadline, I mean, a lot of people would say, you know, that Colorado lineup to me, you know, is every bit as good as the Dodgers, and it may be. Yeah. But I think, I, I do think that, I'm not sure who's going to win that division. Uh, I think if the Dodgers play the Cubs, I don't know if they move on. I mean, uh, the Cubs got tons of problems this, this year going in themselves, too, particularly in the bullpen. I mean, I think the Hamels pickup could be a huge pickup in this postseason. You, know, you put him with Lester and Hendricks, who's kind of turned the corner a little bit. I, I, I think the Cubs are probably going to be there, even if they play the Dodgers, would be my bet, despite the fact that Jansen's probably better than anybody the Cubs have, in particular with Strope, who is throwing the ball well, is not going to pitch now the rest of the season. Um, I think the other, the other, the other division. If, if Colorado wins, 
and Atlanta wins. I kind of like Colorado just because a little bit more veterans, a little bit more experience. So if you had to ask me today, I'd pick the Cubs in Colorado in the NL mm-hmm. to the final okay. two, and I would pick the uh, I would pick the Indians to upset the Astros, and I would probably Whoa. pick the Yankees to win the Yankees to win the wild card, and the Yankees to meet the Indians this time in the NLCS. That's what I would pick so, at this point. So what do you think would have the advantage uh, the Indians have over the Yankees? I'm not sure the Indians have any advantage over the Yankees at this point. I mean, I think the starting pitching, despite the fact mm-hmm. the Yankees got a little bit bigger names, particularly with Tanaka and Sabathia, I think, you know, the, the Indians' top three is as good as the Yankees' top three. It just doesn't get the same press. I mean, you, are you – do you feel Bowers as good as Severino? I do. If Bauer, if Bauer comes back, um, uh, obviously healthy, he's due back. Um, and, um, I mean, the thing I always question when a guy has – a season that that's been very different than the rest of his career. When they get injured, do they still have that momentum? Do they still have what they changed so drastically over the course? I mean, Bauer was an average pitcher before this year at best. He showed some stuff, but he wasn't dependable in my eyes. Um, he was as he was as well regarded as Cole was when they both pitched at UCLA. He, he was, at, at, at and this year level quite, at the pro level. You're right. Quite frankly, he is probably, um, in my eyes, was the best pitcher in the American League, uh, quite frankly, uh, before he, he was. He was. But, I mean, Clevenger yeah. and Carrasco have had good years. I mean, you look at their statistics, they've had very good years. Very pleased with Clevenger. I think they're as deep as the Yankees' rotation was. I think yeah. the loss of Miller's a big loss, but that pickup in hand could end up being huge. He doesn't blow people away like Miller does. No. Fletch said he does get people out from both sides of the plate. And Allen's had a damn good year. I mean, he doesn't have the Kimbrell-type numbers, or he's not as electric as, as Chapman is. But Chapman hasn't been a great postseason pitcher, Dave. I mean, no, he, he has <laughs> but but Allen hasn't played uh, – hasn't pitched well um, consistently this year. Um, I hope – I mean, he has potential to be a shutdown closer, as he's been in the past. But um, let's just say he's no Oliver Perez at this point. He isn't. He has an over his, he's not, over he's not even the basket spectacular at times. But I do think he's got some good stuff. I think, you know, they've got some, un, I mean, I don't know if this matters that much at, at pro sports with the money they're making, but they've got some unfinished business. Let's face yeah. it. They lost the Cubs two years ago. Last year, that was a huge upset in a lot of people's mind, particularly theirs with the Yankees. You know, yeah. Houston just, Houston and the Dodgers have been good teams this year. They're just, they just don't feel sounds a little bit of a goofy – they just don't feel like the same teams as they were last year to me. You know, the Dodgers have struck out a lot more. They almost got too many guys now. I mean, I, Roberts has a problem, uh, it seems to me, with too many guys. You know, Houston – a couple guys on Houston have had some pretty average years. I mean, now two days missed a lot of time. I think Correa is hitting 255. You know, I just have a feeling that Cleveland's going to nose them out. I think it's going to be an exciting series. Kind of remind me a little bit of the, the – you know, some of the series in the 80s, Houston and the Phillies. A lot of back and back and forth type of stuff. I could see it, but one of those very good teams is going to go out first. And I just have a feeling the Indians have a little bit of unfinished business. I think the Astros are still pretty much pretty much a young team. Great rotation. I mean, McCullers may end up getting a ball to close these games out, as it looks now to me. But they don't have that resolved yet. You know, Allen may not be perfect, but at least it's resolved with who they're going to give the ball at the end of the game. You know, so and, I, hope and I don't know. Kluber, Kluber's been a good postseason pitcher, not a great one. He's got some of the Kershaw disease. I right. think he's gonna, I think he's going to feel some of that too, which is why I make the the prediction that he, I make here. And I, he I think, certainly doesn't doesn't pitch to his uh, his regular season in the postseason. That's correct. Now, Fletch, are you going to tell me that, that Cleveland's going to win? I don't know well, if they're going to win. I just think that if you had to ask me right now, we're talking about. I'm not being a politician here. But you asked me about the, the final four. Well, the final four, I'd pick Cleveland, and I'd probably pick the Yankees again. I think the Yankees' huh? A's wild card game, boy, that's a that's a flip a coin though, because they're both the exact same team, different reasons. You know, the A's bullpen's been as good, no names. The Yankees' bullpen's bigger names. It's been up and down with some injury. Starting yeah. staff, you know, the A's got some questions. I think the Yankees do too, even though they got their names in there. I mean, I don't feel great about. I don't. Feel, who would you give the ball to? I mean, it's going to. I mean, the races aren't going to be close. So these teams right. are going to be able to position. Who, well, I think that's, they're going to give the ball. That's to the like whole thing right now that race. we're going to see in these last two weeks, guys. Is, is setting up rotations, setting up who's going to pitch in those wild card games. That's going to be 
you know, there, there are a couple races that are that are still in, in there, but you know, it, that's what that's what these next two weeks are for. And you know, in my mind, yeah, I, I agree with you, Dave. The top three teams are in the AL. You know, Red, yep. the Red Sox are clearly the class of baseball. I mean, they, they've already topped the 100 win mark. You know, it's pretty impressive at this point. You know, I think their franchise record for wins uh, is 105, and that was all the way back in 1912 when yep. Smokey Joe Wood and Tris Speaker led them to a, a World Series title. Which coincidentally was the last pretty, time they won 100 games. Uh, I believe they won 100 games with Babe Ruth a few weeks, a few years after that. Uh, I was going to say, maybe weeks would be tough. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, the Babe was a workhorse. He, he was, he was, but that, that was an interesting stat. I heard is the Pirates have the longest uh, streak of not winning 100 games in baseball at this point. Really? So, yes. Well, yes, I do. don't think that they'll be uh, hitting that. <laughs> um, you know, in the but West, I, you know, you, you got to like the Astros. Is there, uh, they got that the lead. And here's the thing that, that fascinated me, guys. I didn't realize that their their one two punch of Garrett Cole, you know, first of all, moving out of Pittsburgh and getting away from the Dan Russell curse was probably the best name for that in the Cole. <laughs> and Justin Verlander, they both topped two hundred and fifty strikeouts. You know the last time that happened? We Who don't. Two thousand and two and it was Kurt Schilling and Randy Johnson. Whoa. Wow. That's a great yeah, it, I didn't I, that's I didn't have that detail, but I knew it's been a while. Yeah. And uh, the A's, I, I never thought I'd be saying that the A's are my third-ranked team. Uh, their, their last home stand of the regular season starts tomorrow, and they have six games at the Coliseum, so they could actually clinch a playoff spot in front of their home fans. It would be nice. You know, it's a team that, uh, you know, back in my youth, I, I, I loved the A's. Uh, they were my American League team during this. I always seem to come up uh, short to those great Oriole teams. Um, but here's the thing, since the middle of June, the, the – the A's have the second best record in the league, so they're they're playing some good ball. Uh, the the Indians clinching, um, you know, again it's it's a matter of, of who's healthy, who's not. Um, they've got the thing that I like about them is they have the right manager pushing the buttons and Terry Francona. You know, it's going to be hard for them to overcome, you know, Houston and, and the Red Sox. But if anyone can do it, um, his leadership would seem to be there. You know, then there's the Yankees. Uh, they seem to be. You know, they, they tail off a little bit, and they risk not hosting that playing game. But, you know, as we've seen with the Pirates, it's not a guarantee to win if you're the home team. Uh, but you try to avoid heading to that hostile territory. But in the AL, for me, it's going to come down to, you know, who gets hot in the next couple of weeks. You know, in the, in the National League, we still have some semblance of races. You know, and for me, it's up for grabs. I think that the Cubs have a slight, you know, they have that slight lead over the Brewers. Um, they're, they're both the close to locks for a playoff spot, but the, the that's going to come down to the wire. Uh, the Braves have pulled away, like you said, Dave. Uh, the Dodgers and the Rockies are going back and forth. So whoever uh, doesn't capture that division crown is going to have to contend with the, the Cardinals for that final wild spot. The other thing, um, this may not be breaking news, but Joe Madden is still a dick. It uh, hasn't changed, nor is my belief that the Cubs are the team to beat, unfortunately. You know, hopefully they're going to fold in the playoffs. But, um, by the way, did I mention I hate Joe Madden? Um, <laughs> here's going to be something that's going to be, How do you feel? Here's going to be something that's going to be important for them. They've had a grueling schedule. They've played like 30 games in the stretch of 30 days. Yep. So they need to get some guys rested. But, you know, that infield makes them pretty tough to beat. Yep. Um, the Brewers, well, they ran into that buzzsaw that is the Pirates this weekend. Um uh, but the thing about the, the Brewers is, and thank God that they're finished up with, with the Cubs because they just couldn't beat them head to head. Um, just a just a really quick shout out though to Trevor Williams, tossed another six innings of shutout ball. The guys have an unbelievable second half. Uh, the ERA is one point one nowhere. nine in the second yep. half. One point one nine, absolutely the, incredible. The nice thing for the Brewers though, they got some players coming back like Zach Davis and Jimmy Nelson. So you know who knows, maybe they'll make that last push in there. Um, Braves, pretty much a lock. You have to salute what they've done to rebuild after some down years. You know, they have a series against the Cardinals that can really determine some playoff position. So that should be interesting to watch. Yep. Uh, in my mind, the Rockies are the team that no one wants to face come October, you know, because they they really just they mash the ball. 
Their uh, starting pitching has been much better this season. You know, their weakness is their bullpen, but they spent a lot of ton of money on it in the off season. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. And the Cardinals have been on somewhat of a, you know, they, they've done well since replacing Matt, Mike Matheny in the dugout. They could still win the Central. It's kind of doubtful, but it's looking like they're going to be playing in the wild card game, barring a collapse of the, you know, the Dodgers getting red hot. And speaking of your Dodgers, uh, Gary, they went what? Something like 20 games without hitting a home run, and then. Tweak just went nuts. Yeah, yeah. 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 crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. crazy. You know, crazy. 20 games without a dinger. That's like Sonoli not having bacon for three days. <laughs> it doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. You know, Kershaw's numbers in October, we all know about those, but, you know, every baseball person will tell you, you still rather not face him at all. No. So, I, I don't know who, I, I don't know that I can make my final four yet. It's going to be who's hot at the last moment. It's when, you know, I don't, Really like the uh, the wild card playing game in, in many ways. Yeah. I think it's not a, a, a great um, a way to determine it. But on the other hand, I mean, it puts it, it puts an onus on winning your division, and, exactly. and that part is interesting. But yep. what what I would like to see it happen is that be a best two out of three, and make that first round a best three out of five, and then yeah. we I'm might idea. have a better representation of who the best teams actually are. Right. I agree. I agree. And it would do some serious damage to the wild card entrance. If you had to play a series, you've got to make a decision on just – you don't just have one night to make a decision on who gets the ball. That's right. And I think, I think, you know, I think the thing that could happen very well is I could very well see Oakland come out with an opener, whether it's uh, – you know, they're not going to come out with China, but I could see them come out with, like, Rodney – where somebody like that had pitched two innings and try to get the lead by a couple guys hitting a bomb, and then hold the Yankees off, and that's gonna that's gonna cause that's gonna cause enough debate that we'll probably have it on a podcast. But I yeah, can see I that happening. You know, I, I so. think that would be actually a brilliant thing to do. I, I yep, me too. I've always that's been a fan of it. I, I think I Tampa, gone. Tampa Bay Tampa Bay has proven uh, this year as they've had to go to that method many times because of injuries. They've proven it can be an effective mess. Uh, method. I mean, that is by far, um, say what you will about Oakland, to me, that is by far the most impressive, shocking thing of this year is Tampa Bay. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about that later, Dave. Uh, I, I, well, I, I totally that's agree. Tough. Yeah. Yep. That's another. We'll, we'll, we'll wait. We'll wait on it. I mean, the interesting thing, though, guys, is I don't know about you, but the last few years I haven't felt this torn about who's actually going to win. I mean, there's, I think there's a lot of great series ahead of us, and I'm looking forward to the playoffs to see what happens. I think it's going to be a fascinating playoff. I really do. I think there's going to be a lot of – hate to overuse the word. I think there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff going on this year in the postseason. I think actually – I hate the wild card game too. I think if you really want to damage a wild card entrant, make them play a short, quick series, a three-game set, give the other teams that win a couple of days off, let them set the rotation even better – bullpen, arms rested. I, I do that too, three, then five, then seven. I mean, it's already it's already diluted enough anyway. It may go more that way, as we know. Mm-hmm. But I agree, Fletch. But the, that Oakland-Yankee game, to me, is going to be fascinating. And honestly, the Dodgers-Brewers, which I think it might be, or Rockies-Brewers, is going to be one fascinating wild card game too. You know, And I agree. I think Colorado is really very underrated. That lineup's a lot better, not just because of the, the thin air than a lot of people give it credit for. The pitching's a question. Davis is going to log 40-42 saves. You know, Zern Dreyer, which is out of sight, but everybody's is out there. I mean, he's the one guy, the one hammer in the NL, you think about it, that you would say, you know what, it's pretty assured who it's going to be. Cubs don't know. Yeah. Braves never knew all year long, right? Dodgers, Jansen, well, is his heart going to, is, you know, what's, what's going on? He's been up and down. He's lost five. He's given up a lot of big home runs. I mean, well, and and that, and that you know, be, if they have to go to Colorado for whatever reason, I haven't looked to see what the possibilities are, but that can be an issue there. I mean, he didn't travel there because of right. his heart, um, right? So right. certainly that that can come into play. Wouldn't happen in a wild card game. It would happen in round one. right in the, in a round series. two, yeah. but it could be an issue. But I mean, Davis, you know, Davis was Davis. I was surprised the Cubs would decide to go with Morrow. He's been injured. 
Morrow looked unhittable last year for the Dodgers down the stretch. They decided to let Davis go. That may end up coming back to bite your buddy there more than anything, Fletch, is the fact that yeah. the Cubs don't really have a guy that you can say, give him the ball at the end of the game now. They don't have that. Right. And that might be the Achilles heel. And a lot of teams are facing that. Even Houston's facing that a little bit. I have a feeling they're going to go with McCullers late uh, as they get into the postseason. Or, or well, even one, th- one thing you said, though, Gary, is you know having having that uh, first round be a, a best two out of three. I don't know that it really gives you another team an advantage to have those three days off. Sometimes yeah. when you've got momentum going and you take the, that kind of time off, that, yep. that doesn't help you any. So I, 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 don't I, think love, that, I don't love the whole system, but I also think one game doesn't really damage it. And we've seen that from these wild card teams going pretty deep in the playoffs once they get in. Right. So yeah. I, I agree, though, Fletch. I mean, there, there's no good answer to it. I mean, you probably shouldn't have this kind of goofy situation, but we all better get used to it because it's not going away. Well, but the nice thing is it, it keeps the, the the races going in in some yeah. markets that wouldn't have a race. So, I mean, I, I like that part of it. I just would like to see it be – you know, you, you, and you think about when they first started doing playoffs at the end of the year, whenever there would be ties, it, it wouldn't be just a one-game playoff. So, you're right. Yep. No. Yep. No. And it's it, uh, talked about a lot. I, I do think it's something generally that I read they are considering finally. Um, but um, in in my mind, yeah, it's unfair. I got all that, but damn it, there <laughs> there is nothing more exciting than that one game, um, winner take all. I, I I agree. It's it's not for the best necessarily to find the best team going forward, but I uh, you know I, I I I do enjoy the excitement of that. It's it's you know game seven right there. Um, it is, but when it's done every year after year, it does lose. I I I'm not to me. yeah not disagree. And they haven't yeah. they've always been good games. They've been blowouts a lot of times too. So I mean, yeah, that's right. Last year certainly were, and everybody expected them to be close. Trust me, the Yankees are going to scream bloody murder. If Davis hits a home run in the first inning and then Chapman or somebody hits one in the second inning and then the A's start going and shut them down and they're going to, they're going to, the Yankees of all people are going to scream bloody murder if they go out two to one in that wild card game. You know, they're going to yeah. pitch about the fact they open with a opener. They're going to, they're going to come. And then obviously there'll be some pressure, you know, because we know. As, as, the, as the guy, pressure. guy always says in that situation when you're division then. Well, yeah. that's right. No, you're right. Yeah, that's, you're right. Now, that's where I am. But yeah. you know they got a lot of influence, and we all know that. Well, so. I, I mean, but I like I like seeing I like seeing more teams in the playoff hunt. I just I guess I want my cake and I want to eat it too. Yeah. I want my yeah. eggs and I want my bacon too. Maybe that's maybe that's the way to say it. And your your English muffin with nooks and crannies. There you go. There you go. So, no, I, I I think it'd be great if they did that. I just, um, you know, I I. I I agree it's better for baseball. I just love that excitement of the one game. I, 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 I mean, it's certainly, you know, in the world we're in today, and yeah. I think the game having some interest problems for a lot of people like we've talked about, I, I'm, not, yeah. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not complaining about it. But I, but I yeah. do think baseball is not determined by one night. And, no, it shouldn't and, be. And, and I think as you play 162, it does cheap a little bit. But I, I think this is where we are. So, you know, yeah. it's still, I'm good with it. I just think that, you know, with Oakland's limping into this in the mound, the Yankees aren't as good on the mound as they like to sell themselves. But trust me, if they lose that because of what happens and the way the strategy is, there's going to be some loud carpet for them because they complain about everything. You know, they well, the thing that, 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 I, that I will hate if that does happen like that is because it's such a copycat thing that everyone's going to try it. I mean, I, I think you're going to see more of it. I think the fact that Tampa and Oakland have had such success with it I think you're going to see more of it. And I don't love it either. I mean, I honestly, compared to what we're going to talk about next, it makes your stomach turn. But I, unfortunately, that's where we are. I mean, I think but it, uh, it, that's it, where it's we are. But it's also for yeah. Tampa Bay, it, it's brilliant managing. I mean, well, it they, is. They it, it's managing the club that you have. Yeah. Getting manager of the year consideration. Yeah. yeah. We're going to win I, 90 games. They might win 90 games. It's, it's, I was down there. Yeah, they're, 80, they're 16 games weeks. over right now. It's I mean, unbelievable. They're gonna, they're, they've gone 60 and 40, for Christ's sakes. Yeah, well, here's the thing, guys. That. I still, I still long for the days where a fat guy like Mickey Lulich can go out there and give me 300 innings. That's what I want. Well, he used to pitch. That's the deal. Well, I, I just saw Mickey Lulich pitch yesterday. I don't know that he could go the 300 innings anymore. <laughs> 
he looked like he was struggling a little bit. Uh, he's got uh, 70 years old, so. Uh, probably a little more. Jesus, the 50th yeah. anniversary of uh, the 68 championship, and he was a veteran at that point. So, yeah, he's, he's probably bordered in on 80 at this point. So the fact that he's out there, i got to give him credit for it. So. But okay. I tell you, he looks like he could still pitch. It's Davey Kovac. Yep. Oh, he's in good shape. He's yep. in good shape. He probably wouldn't have to walk up to the catcher to throw him the ball underhand. <laughs> Kofax could probably hit you. He could hit you, man. But uh, And I think Gibson would still drill you if you looked at him wrong. <laughs> that I wouldn't doubt. That I wouldn't doubt. But oh, Those were the days. Those were the days, my friends, when the Pirates were competing for World Series championships. Um, and then our next segment, uh, we're going to talk a little about our last two world champions, uh, um, as we're gonna we're gonna compare uh, Pittsburgh teams, I think uh, time time and time again over the the next few months. But uh, tonight we're gonna talk about uh, two teams that won world championships in our lifetime. Um, you know, certainly we were lucky enough to see that as our children uh, uh, and the next generation hasn't seen. But um, with seventy one. Um, you got a young team who who looked like they were going to be, um, I don't want to say a dynasty, but it looked like they were going to win quite a few uh, 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 potential World Series going forward. A team uh, led by um, a veteran in Roberto Clemente. Um, certainly Willie Stargell was, was just beginning uh, uh, one of the great peaks in, in club history um, as he comes to uh, Three River Stadium out of the shackles of Forbes Field and, and shows he's one of the game's best uh, power hitters. Um, against a team that basically, while very good, um, wasn't a team that we were expecting to uh, win a World Series in, in 1979. Um, although I can, I can say, and I will boldly say here, as I wrote the column, The Nose Knows, for the Greensburg Central Catholic uh, Centralite newspaper, I made the claim there, and I have it in case you doubt me, that the signing of Dave Parker was more important than the Phillies signing Pete Rose and that the Pirates would win the World Series. So I have proof here that I am the only man to predict that before the season came. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. We, uh, we're comparing these two teams, and, and I go down, and I mean, I think the Pirates uh, of 79 have an advantage uh, everywhere in the infield. I mean, Robbie uh, had a great uh, season at first base for the Bucks in 71, but how do you top Stargell's MVP performance in 79? Um, I think the Garner-Stennett uh, duo was uh, um, certainly uh, better than the Cash-Maz duo. I, I think uh, um, Cash may have been the best defensively of the group, but, but Garner and Stennett were, were certainly a more dangerous duo. Uh, once we got Tim Foley in, in house. Um, he had a what, what was probably his career year offensively that year was steady defensively, and Ali and Hernandez just were so piss poor offensively that that's not a comparison. Um, Hebner was solid, but Madlock uh, hit 328 for the team, and once they got him, pretty much put him over the top. So you give the advantage to uh, to the 79 Pirates everywhere in the infield. Um, Robinson and Lacey were solid in, in the outfield, Robinson giving uh, some power, um, but Willie Stargell hit 48 homers, case closed at, at left. And right, um, you know, even though Parker hit 310 with, with some power, Clemente was still at his uh, apex defensively, and he hit 341 that year. His leadership skill gives, gives a, a nod to me in right field there. Um, center field, probably the closest, the Oliver Kleins duo versus Marino. I gave a slight edge to Marino um, just because of the speed and the uh, defense in center. Sangi probably, to me, has the biggest advantage in, in catcher um, of any position there. I think Ott and Nikosha were solid, but Sangi was one of the best in the game at the time. Um, even though the starting rotation in 79 was probably a more balanced, um, Blass and Ellis were two of the best pitchers in the game. Um, and while light years ahead of Moose Walker and Johnson, I give the nod to 71 because, you know, quite frankly, um, they are far and away the two best pitchers in comparison to the two teams. Um, Justy had a phenomenal year. Um, 
but I think the Teak Romo, uh, uh, Jackson, and in the playoff, uh, Robinson to, to boot, to me, they they were the, uh, the better team there, uh, the better staff. But to me, I'm going to give the nudge to, um, to the 71 team. I think they had um, – I, I just think they were uh, uh, a little better compared to the rest of the league offensively. Um, they certainly had better power, but to me the difference is going to be the starting pitching in that team. Um, to me, Blass and Ellis in, in a seven-game series, Blass and Ellis would be the difference um, in, in, uh, in that series. And um, while the 79 bullpen was better, you really didn't need um, – the 71 bullpen as much with with those guys and and if you if you end up uh, uh, wherever you want to put Browse whether you put him in the, in the starting rotation whether you put him in the bullpen as he he was all year I think he's a good enough setup man um, to have uh, to have made a little difference there but I just I just see it a very close offensive uh, uh, race between the two but I think Blass and Ellis put uh, put him over the edge Fletch how do you see it well, <clears throat> head-to-head, uh, first base, I have it pretty much even. I mean, even the Sarge by MVP year, Robertson was just he, – he also, much like Sarge, they had an unbelievable postseason. Uh, but the thing that Bob Robertson you don't think about a lot is he was a good glove man too. So I, I really have that one even. Uh, second base, I'm with you on that. Garner had a little bit more pop than, than Cash. Uh, shortstop Foley had a career year for them. Third, I had it even because you know Hebner knocked in. Hebner hit 27 homers there, 20 homers that year, so he gave you more pop than Madlock did. Madlock was the difference, uh, absolutely, in, in picking him up. Uh, left, I have start the Sargeo uh, over the platoon of Milner and Robinson. Uh, center, I have that pretty much even. Uh, you, you know, with Oliver and Klein, you had a little bit more offense, but with Marino, you had that great speed. Uh, and right, you know, again, that one's close. Uh, you know, I'm a Clemente guy, so I got you know I'm, I'm going that way. Uh, catcher, there's no question. Uh, starting pitching, obviously 71. I mean, Ellis won 19 games. Blast led the league in shutouts, and we we know what he did in the series. The thing about that series, that team was fascinating, though, guys. Is if you think about, it, they had six different starters for those seven games. That's that's yeah. kind of unheard of. Yeah. yeah. Um, and both teams had clutch performances in muscle and games. You had Bryles in 71 and Rooker in 79. So, I mean, I think that it's – I'm going to give that still to the, the starting pitching at 71. The bullpen, I'm going to say it's even maybe a slight edge for 71. I mean, you had a great lefty combination in the days before lefty combinations were really that big. I mean, you had Ramon Hernandez as a shutout, shutdown guy as a lefty and, and just he was – 31 saves that year led the league. So, I mean, that was a pretty pretty potent uh, bullpen. And then the bench, I'm going to give 71 a slight uh, slight advantage on that. But for me, the thing to, to look at is just the competition that they were facing. Mm-hmm. You know, in, in, in 1971, the Pirates really weren't threatened in their division. I mean, they topped the Cardinals, I think, by seven games. And that Cardinal team, you know, they had a few stars. They had uh, MVP Joe Torrey took two-thirds of the Triple Crown that year. He led the league he had 363, and he also uh, led the league in RBIs. He also had Lou Brock hitting 300 and stealing 60 bases, and Ted Simmons also topping 300. You know, the Cardinals had a 20-game winner in Steve Carlton. I think it was, that was his last year before they moved him to Philadelphia, and they also had an aging Bob Gibson. And he still managed to win 16 games, including a no-hitter that I witnessed uh, against Whoa. the Pirates. So that was, uh, yeah, that was one of my great baseball memories. Um, in the West, you know, the Giants held off the Dodgers by a game. The, the Giants had two sluggers whose best years were pretty much behind them. They had a 40-year-old Willie Mays, and Willie McCovey missed a significant amount of, of games that year. Uh, Bobby Bonds was their star. He popped uh, 30-some homers that year. And on the mound, they had two Hall of Famers in Gaylord Perry and Juan Marichal. They both posted uh, sub three ERA. So that's you know, that was an interesting matchup for them. But you know, a fun fact about that first about that year's NLCS, it was the first time in either league that the series wasn't a sweep. Uh the first two years, oh, wow. both in the American yeah. League and the National League, they were uh they were sweeps. So 
And, you know, and, and the Pirates, when kind of gave in the first game, it didn't look that very good, you know. So it, it, if you look back at it, the key was game three when Bob Johnson, Bob Johnson, he had, he had the very ugly hairdo. That was an ugly man, that Bob Johnson. Uh, he he outdueled uh, Juan Marichal two to one. That was a that was a big game. One of the clutch performances in NLCS history. So then let's look at 1979. The Pirates won by only two over a very surprising young Expos team. And you know, without the acquisition of Bill Madlock, like you mentioned, Dave, I don't know what happens there. Um, I don't think they win it. And so that Expos team, even without Dave's favorites of John Bacabella, Coco Leboy, and Ron Hunt. That team had some pop. They had had four guys topping 20 homers. Larry Parrish, Andre Dawson, uh, Ellis Valentine, one other person who was it? Uh, Oh, Gary Carter. Gary Carter. Carter, yeah. Yeah, they went the best staff, but you had Steve Rogers, you know, before he became Captain America, he was there. Um, You had Bill Lee knocking uh, knocking 16 wins. And Woody Fryman, the former Pirate, uh, found a nice spot in their bullpen. The farmer. But... uh, but it was a uh, you know achieving year by a scrappy bunch. Uh, the playoffs that year, the Bucks, they, you know, they swept the Reds. But you know, only the decisive game there was a real blowout. The the first two were extra inning affairs. You know, you don't really think about that. Uh, the Reds weren't a great team. No one drove in over a hundred. They only had three starters who won more than ten, and that was uh, Tom Seaver's sixteen. So. I think that that, uh, that 71 team, you know, and especially what they did against the, that vaunted Orioles pitching staff at four 20-game winners, uh, I have to give the edge to the 71 overall because of all those factors. Yeah. I, 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 would, I would tend to agree with you. And plus, if you compare their, even though their offensive numbers may be a tad below what 79 did, if you compare them to the, uh, the leagues at the time, 71 was, was a more dominant team offensively. Um, but a fact that uh, you had mentioned about Jim Rooker, in 79, we were, uh, uh, Billy Rainier and myself, were at a, um, a Sabre meeting, and um, Rooker made the claim that the reason they won that series, he said the, the scouts had scouted um, Boston or Baltimore's offense so horribly that they decided at that point to do the opposite of what the scouts were telling them to do. And they used the Costanzo method. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly what it was, and and they did the exact opposite of what they they uh, did. And what what they give up? Like three runs, two runs, three runs over the uh, two runs over the last three games. Right. So I I I always thought that was pretty much all the paying the paying the guys all that money, and and they botched it up so horribly that uh, you had to go Costanza on him to win the series. But that's what he, he always credited with the uh, victory, what was that. Now, um, now Gary, are you going to give 79 love, or are you going to be on the 71 bandwagon? You know, I, I tell you, it's funny. I mean, this is a true toss-up. I mean, and this is one yeah. we could debate, you know, time and time again, and you might change your opinion tomorrow. I mean, I – you're, you know, it's funny. I am going to favor 79 a little bit because I think a couple things that you, know, you got to think about here. I mean, I, I do think that the, the more iconic names, the more Hall of Fame names were probably active in 1971. I think that's right what Fletch points out there. But the game changed quite a bit from 71 to 79, too. I mean, you know, Bly Levin might not have been as electric or Candelaria might not have been as electric as Ellis was with his 19 and 9 in 1971, but he didn't pitch as long. You know, Tanner wanted to, Tanner does a lot of what a lot of what we see now. Tanner was one of the the architects right. of get to the seventh inning. Okay, same with Blylevin. I mean, Blylevin pitched a hell of a lot better than 12 and 5 in 1979. He worked 238 innings. So you know, Blast went deeper. Yeah, Blast threw a lot of shutouts and stuff, and that was before he couldn't find the plate, but. You know, Bly Levin didn't get to the seventh inning. I mean, you went to Jackson and Romo and even Robinson at times and Rooker and Bibby and other guys in the seventh and then, you know, into Colby and Romo, switch them around depending on who the matchups were in those days. It wasn't as defined as today. But, you know, I mean, I'm not really sure. I, I, think, the, I think the league was better, and it may be nostalgic from all of us in 1971. I think even the fourth-place teams were a little bit better. You know, the Braves with Rico Cardi and Aaron. 
you know, the Dodgers in 71, I think Dick Allen was there at that time, or Frank Robinson was too. I mean, they finished fourth. I mean, the league may have been a little bit better, but the league wasn't so bad in 1979 either. Remember, the NL didn't have expansion like the AL did. Right. You know, and the leagues didn't cooperate as much in those days. So we didn't have a Seattle and Toronto in the league. And, you know, it's proved to be that that Montreal team wasn't just a – they were surprised that year, but they weren't a surprise from, you know, from 78 late through 79 all the way to 83. I mean, we knew how good that team was. They added some pieces like Reigns and some others. But that Montreal team, and Dick Williams was a better – even though he was a jackass, he was a better manager than a lot of people gave him credit for. So. Right. I mean, I, I think that outlasting of that Montreal team is a, is, a, is a feather in the cap of the 79 Pirates. The 71 Pirates didn't really have to do that. I mean, right. Yeah, we had Gibson at the end of his career. Yeah, Torrey hit the 363 that year, which was a true 363 because he couldn't, you know, he couldn't run down to first base in 10 seconds. But, I mean, you know, that, that Cardinal team was an average team. that was carried by a couple good veterans, pretty good manager, and Shane Deist. I mean, that Expos team pushed the Pirates to the brink that year and a couple teams that won a bunch of pennants had down years that year but they were still pretty good teams in the Dodgers and the Phillies I mean I think both of them finished fourth that year I don't remember off the top of my head but they were still pretty good teams that had won back-to-back pennants Phillies three Dodgers two you know in that period and yeah the Reds had made some moves uh, in that postseason by the time they got to that postseason I mean Dave Collins had a big year that year I remember we surprised everybody um you know, I, I Sparky wasn't – I don't know Sparky. I don't think Sparky was a manager anymore at that point. Um, and they had some guys on the downside. But that was still a pretty good Reds team uh, with a lot of good up-the-middle defense and everything. So, I mean, I I tend to favor a little bit – I mean, nostalgia-wise, you'd say the 71 bucks. And, they, you know, certainly that World Series performance, you have to – you know, that, that kind of swings the dial to them because that, that Orioles staff – I was lucky enough to be growing up in the East, and I saw that Orioles staff then, and I saw it even through the 70s a lot. I mean, that was the most dominant staff I had ever seen. you know. And, and, and the Pirates did do some pretty good damage at it, and as you say, with the six pitchers. It was amazing they won that World Series. But you can say the same thing about 79. I mean, Scott McGregor, Mike Flanagan, Dennis Martinez, you know, Weaver was still there. I mean, that, that Orioles staff in 79 was pretty good too, and they came back to beat them as well. I mean, I, I kind of favor the, the 79 Pirates, maybe not by position, but I think once you moved Garner to second and you put Madlock at that third spot, and then all of, you know, you, you had all year. I mean, we haven't seen, other than maybe the Orioles team that year and in that era, we haven't seen a platoon worked like, you know, that, that, that Easler, Lacey, you know, uh, Robinson Stargell, Robinson replacing Lacey. We haven't seen that kind of platoon work really since that 79 period as well as that did. And to me, that made a very, very strong bench as well. And I kind of favor the 79 Pirates bench a little more than the Vic Davalio, Milt May, you know, Gene Alley, Bill Mazeroski bench that you saw in 71. And I think, you know, the, the, the bullpen for that 79 Pirates team at the time, because nobody knew the changes that were occurring in the game, and still never gets the recognition that it should have. To Colby, Romo, Grant Jackson, and Robinson in the playoffs, and even during the regular season, even Rooker and Bibby at times in the, in the regular season, the Pirates would get that early lead because Moreno would get on base and he'd steal a couple bases and they would score early, and then you know, maybe Parker or Stargell would get some extra base hits and put you ahead. When you got to the end of the game there, even though they had some losses to Colby and Romo because they pitched a lot more, I mean, look at the innings they worked, 135 for Colby, 129 for Romo. I mean, that was the course. That that changed the game the way a lot of things we see now. And I kind of think that bullpen was far better. I mean, you didn't need to get to Justy as much as you did. And Justy did have a fantastic year in 71. But the the four or five arms that would come out of that pirate bullpen, it proved to be the case in the World Series, too. I kind of I kind of favor a little bit the 79 Pirates because of the strength of bench. I think Bly Levin and Candelaria's numbers are downplayed a little bit. I think Bly Levin, when he was right, and Candelaria, when he was right, were every bit as dominant as, as Ellis and, and Blass was. I mean, you know, if you take Parker's personality away, for a three- or four-year period of time, he was the best player in the game. Clemente was yeah, one was. of the most exciting players for 20 years. But honestly, if you wanted, if you needed to hit the ball out of the park, you'd look to Parker. 
you know, or you need well, to Well, but extra. keep in mind where he was playing, too. I mean, Kalenny was playing in a big ballpark like that. And when they need the the year that they did need him to, to get some home runs, the management asked him to do that uh, in 1965, 1966, he did. So, now, I'm not saying that he uh, couldn't do it, but, I mean, I think – I mean, I, I think it's also a different game, too. The, the, it was definitely a pitcher's uh, era that he played a lot of the time in. But, but yeah, no, I, here's the thing, though, guys. I mean – I'm gonna I'm gonna play the stratomatic card on this one. I would say that the '79 team, having managed both of those teams in stratomatic, it was a much more fun team to manage because of the speed, the bullpen, all of those things. However, I, I think that the I do I still think that the '71 team was, was just a little bit better. Uh, I think the '72 team was better than the boat, frankly. Well, I mean, that's the one thing that leans you the dial to 71, is in 72, other than a, a very you know, disappointing postseason series, and in 74 again, they won three out of four years. The, the 79 Pirates can't claim that. So, I mean, that has a tendency to swing the dial a little bit to 71. But if you're asking me about one individual year, I have a tendency to pick the 79 Pirates. I mean, I, I probably saw a little more. I was a little bit older. You know, I wasn't in the you know Western Pennsylvania in '71, but I certainly did watch a lot of that season. That's probably the the season I the first one I watched from start to finish. I mean, I love both teams. Both teams never get the credit they deserve. I mean, right. to be quite frankly, but you know the the dial swings a little bit if you look in subsequent periods. I mean, the Pirates challenged a little bit in '82, but they fell off the pace late. You know, they had made some personnel change. I think Ray came for Garner by that point. There were some other things going on. Stargell wasn't – Stargell had one booming big year in 79. He was really never the same after that. You know, and the 71 team had some pretty good success, which is basically the same core for two of the next three seasons. You can't say that about 79. But in that and, one year, I would just have a tendency to favor the 79 Pirates because of bench, because of the bullpen. And, you know, with all – I mean, it's, it's chicken shit. But they did win one more game over the course of the season. Now – I don't think the competition in the NL that year was the same talent and the same legendary names as you saw in 71, but that was a very, very good year in the NFL with, or the, the, in the NL in 79 with about six or seven good teams that the Pirates ended up outlasting. So, I mean, you know, it's, so it's that's close, my – close, and I, I love what Al Oliver said about the 72 as we talk about that and talk about the 71's place in history. Um, had they held on in 72 in the NLCS and won the World Series, which I think they were a better team than, than Oakland, and I, I do think they would have won the World Series that year had they held on there. He made, he made the claim you would have been talking about the Pirates as the best team of that decade and not the Big Red Machine. And, and you think about it, if they beat the A's, well, the A's don't have their three World Series in a row. Yep. Um and the Pirates end up with three championships in the decade. So, I mean, yep. it makes a valid point that that, 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 but would, that would have been a, that would have been a fascinating matchup too. When you have two yeah. great left-handers, an uh, invited blue and Kenny Holtzman against the you know, some of the the, the Pirates' left-handed power, that would have been a, a real interesting uh, series sure. to see. Sure, they were vastly different teams. I think we talked about this on one of the previous casts. You know, I saw a lot of that Oakland team, both live in Baltimore, and because I would get Yankee broadcasts in those days. Uh, right. Back then, you played 12 teams against teams in the in the in the other division. Oakland was a fascinating team. It was not a particularly big offensive team, but it was because of the park and that starting pitching. And then Fingers Fingers was to Colby with more velocity and more innings. Yeah. And you know that would have been a fascinating that would have been a more fascinating series maybe even than the Reds and the A's was with all the thing that happened there with oh I, I would definitely agree it may have been yeah. and and you know the part that you know seventy three why the Pirates fell apart they probably had some injuries and I don't recall now and then the Dodger team in seventy four that Dodger team in seventy four just seemed to have everything going right all year but the Pirates are a bit as good of a team as the Dodgers were. yeah I mean so, I mean the Pirates coming off the death of Clemente uh, yep Blast goes goes south I mean. Yep. You know, it, there there were just a lot of factors beyond yep. injuries that that caused them to struggle that year. Um, I mean, Oliver's, Oliver's point's valid. I mean, I, I guess I'm a little biased because I still love that. I mean, I'm not as bothered if you notice, guys, when we talk about baseball by the strikeouts and the home runs. I mean, I still love that Earl Weaver baseball, Dave. You and I have talked about this. I saw a ton yeah. of that when I was a kid, 75 miles down the road in Harrisburg where there was nothing going on. You know, I like a defensive center fielder. Moreno, you know, I loved Oliver. 
he continued to yeah. play extremely well in Texas and Montreal after that. But I mean, but he wasn't Marino is a very underrated player in Pirate history. You know, yeah. I mean, all the steals and the defense. I mean, he was a major factor. He was Tim Raines without the electric extra base power. But I mean, he did so many things for that '79 team and those Pirate teams that never gets enough credit. And you know, he may be a difference too. You know, close games postseason. That up the middle defense matters. I think the Pirates of seven hour were a little bit better that way. I just do. Yeah. So that's I mean, I, I think it would be a, a close, uh, close series uh, for sure. Perhaps Fletcher ought to get his Stratomatic uh, cards out or his computer out. And <laughs> play I think it. We play all it. instant, we'll, instant uh, we'll play a hundred games. Instant play a yeah. hundred games. Let's let's put it together and see who would win. And we report next week, damn it. The only one that you have to scratch off is Rooker or Keeson, because they were there for both of them. But other than those two, yeah. you could well, see Sarger was rosters. Too. Yep, yep. Sarger was too. Who was? Absolutely. Sarger was on both teams. So, um, okay, we're going to go to our lightning round, our biggest moments of the week. We're going to start with you, Gary, your biggest moment of the week. I mean, I thought the college football Saturday, I mean, it was it was well in, there was 10 minutes to go in the fourth quarter, but the BYU upsetting Wisconsin and LSU, who, despite the fact that, you know, they're probably a little bit better than people realize we know now, but, you know, coming back against Auburn in a tough place and winning on that field goal at the end of the game, I thought college football Saturday afternoon was uh, was was fantastic. I mean, I, I think that would probably be my moment of the week looking back. And... It's not really a moment of the week, but I, I think I gotta I gotta say, looking at the standings and thinking about Tampa Bay. I was down there in, in May on vacation. They were 22 and 26. They've gone 60 and 31 since in wow. a building that nobody goes to, that nobody talked about, and you get heavy criticism in Florida because it's such a status he plays for unloading Souza, who struck out 300 times. Yeah, full credit to the organization. Full credit to Cash. I mean, I, that's not really a moment of the week, but that's certainly something ought to be recognized this week because they're going to win 88 games. Hooray for them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, no. It's And they've done it under dire circumstances. I mean, And they made some great moves at the trade deadline, too. Yes, they did. They yes, did. They did. They did. They did. I mean, you know, uh, what Archer is going to turn out here is still debatable, but, I mean, they made some great moves, not just from uh, the Pirates, but from – other areas too. They upgraded their team, and they certainly have a bright future. Absolutely, but I mean, your point about Wisconsin. The great thing about college football, that loss kills their national championship hopes because one loss to BYU is yeah. they're done, and that's a great thing. Every friggin' game counts, and that's that's what I love about college football. Mr. Yeah. Fletcher, your moment. Well, for me, it was the Steelers' defense or lack thereof. Um, here's, since Ryan Shazier went down, they're averaging giving up 30-plus points a game. and Nowhere is that more evident than seeing tight ends continually rip them for big games down the middle. I mean, it, it's, it's just embarrassing to see. I'm so glad they brought in Coach Bradley to help with their tackling techniques. And, you know, I, I'm not so sure how Coach Butler still has a job, but, hey, you know, so, boys, uh, I say this is a really bad defense, and I'm wondering if it would be possible to revise my 10-5-1 prediction of last week. Well, you, you'll get the you'll get the chance in the next round. That's that's your call. We we can do that. But it was ugly. It was, I think you got to get a strong safety on a tight end once in a while. I don't understand. I don't know the coaches like you guys do, but I mean Kelsey. Well, there, Kelsey's not there was a, there was a play yesterday. When I, and I'm watching this, you know, one of the nice things about sitting up high is you get to see things, you know, develop as they go. And I'm watching, I'm, I'm looking and going, that can't be right. They had J, they had T.J. Watt lined up on a wide receiver. Yeah, that's my, that's my point. And I'm yeah. looking at that like, you've got to be kidding me. Baffling. Well, yep. here, here's, here's the thing. I mean, you knew it was bad in the off season. You knew you had troubles. And I was just dumbfounded that they literally did nothing to significantly upgrade that defense, uh, bringing in a new coordinator, um, getting a linebacker to, to get some uh, um, get, get a rush on the quarterback a little better. Um, this whole concept of throwing extra safeties in instead of linebackers, I'm not sure is going to be a trend in the National Football League. 
Well, it, it might be better if they actually took good angles to the to the ball. I mean, it, that's the other thing about it being up high. You see some of the stuff, and you think, well, and the, and the tackling was just horrendous yesterday too. So that right. was so. I mean, my, my my other mini thing that I would say too is the the whole Josh Gordon going to to uh, the Patriots looks like that's happening today, and I, I, I'm a little I don't know when you have players like like him and then you had Garrett Blunt a few years back, when you have someone who's a disgruntled player who basically quits on his team and gets rewarded by being picked up by the Patriots, I don't think that's a good precedent, fellas. I just don't. No, I, I would agree with you. And probably, I, I mean, we, we uh, a friend of mine mentioned to me yesterday as I was uh, bitching to him about it, he said, you know what, the kind of shit that's happening here, social media, bad attitudes, he said, yep. It's the game," he said. "You yep. see it in every city. You just don't see it because you're you're thinking you're uh, just seeing the Steelers. But it happens in every city. It's it's to me. It's it's one of the things that uh, uh, ended up. What was it? The Redskins ended up uh, having their first no sellout in like forty some years. Um, wow. and, and you're going to start seeing that uh, around because uh, people are becoming a little disgruntled with with all this. Uh, when was it Pouncy or Bay or somebody, Hayward Bay? Somebody said, well, it's just the world we're in. So we just got to move on from it. We can't dwell on that. Somebody said that today, I saw. Yeah, it is It is the world we're in. Absolutely. But, so, uh, um, you know, thank thank God we have Steelers challenging. Not not that the fans aren't, aren't jack-offs who make the comments, because, you know, they certainly are. But at some point in time, you just got to not look at it. After a loss, you know what's coming. You know, it's but, funny, Dave. I don't know if you saw it, but Fletch, it sounds like you were there. I mean, Washington was a factor in the first couple series, and then he just completely went away from them. Like, I didn't get that either. Like, I mean, you know, like, yeah. what what was the thought there? Like, then he decided to go to Schuster all the time. And, of course, Brown, you know, he's crying like Owens did on the sidelines. I mean, if I was one of those coaches, I would just say, just sit your ass down. You know, the media's watching this stuff. And he doesn't yeah. like it too bad. What's he going to do about it? You know, walk yeah. off? I mean, just sit down and shut up, and we'll talk about it. They go to a throwing helmet with and, his buddy Livion. I mean, this kind of nonsense. Like, I mean, you know how bad it was, Gary. He actually went down. and He was sitting with the kickers. You know, <laughs> you know, it's bad at that point when and your wife goes to sit with, sit with, with the kicker. That's the way juvenile you are. Okay, I mean, if you're really a winner, you go in the huddle and say, "Look, here's what I'm seeing," or here you go in the, in the when they meet together and say, "Here's right. what I'm seeing." You know, I mean, stop worrying about getting the ball. I mean, you know, they, they. I thought that they did a smart thing by not giving them the ball so much early. They actually, once they got going, I mean, well, they fell out the problem is up. they forced the ball to him when he's not open, and that and that's what, that's where the problem is. I mean, I didn't get the whole. I mean, you know, I hate to say it, it it's Tomlin's decision making and their decision making as a coaching staff just reminded me a little bit of that Pitt Penn State game a week earlier. Like, what are you doing this for now? Like, you know what I mean? I mean, what did they what did they run the ball 12 times or something? I mean, you know, come 15. on. I mean, I know you're down 21 to nothing against a pretty good offensive team, but my goodness. I mean, you know, it just didn't make any sense. So, so it was horrible, but the, then again, it wasn't the offense that lost that game. So. No, no, and I don't think it's going to be all year. I, I don't. I think based upon two games, you can see that it's already an issue. So yeah. it's a pretty good front four, or a pretty good front three or four, too, which is a shame. No, they, they've, they've given up what in their in their last two home games they've given up what eighty seven points. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, that hurts. And, uh, uh, you know, it's 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 always been based on great linebacker play, and right now, you know, you don't have great linebackers, and nope. um, that's the, the defensive line is great, and the the offensive or defensive backfield is small with the uh, the depth is poor. Um, but again, that's salary cap football. You put you put all your money into the offense. That's what. You well, it is. At. But you all, you also tend to uh, you, they they've gone a lot to this. Let's let's uh, draft the great athletes. You know. Yeah. They so you, you look at Bud Dupree. You know. Yeah. He had more off Bud yesterday than tackles. He did, but he was tackle. a guy. He was a raw talent. Now maybe you get someone who's not quite as the the, the great athlete, but who's flip, who's more football ready. If yeah. you're not going to have a, a coaching staff that's going to develop players, which they don't seem to right now. Right. Well, I mean, honestly, your point about the tackling too, Fletch. I mean, we were playing flag football at 
Playboys in 1983, but I honestly think we could all tackle better than that. I mean, some of those defensive backs. I mean, well, when when Kowski showed us how to. Well, uh, after he threw up, <laughs> he, he was good. <laughs> he showed us how to be great. I'll make you great. <laughs> but I mean, the tackling for pro football. That's well, you know, here's the thing: you, you don't have as much practice time anymore, either, guys. I mean, that's one of the things with the collective bargaining. Yeah. There, there's not as much full contact. Um, so, I mean, something's got to give. And, it does. And quite frankly, in my eyes, if you're not going to give these guys some reps in the preseason, I don't want to hear about the injury. People are going to yeah. get injured. You're right. If you're not going to give them the reps in preseason to get – because this is this is a problem in a lot of with a lot of teams coming out of the gate uh, a little sluggish, then just have the two damn games – that people are whining about and play two more regular season games. Cause I mean, I hate Jones, but I kind of agree with him about that thought. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. And honestly, for the fans, yeah. it's not particularly good to give them two exhibition games. It mean nothing. Well, I, I hate paying no, for especially two. when you charge full price for it. That's, yeah. that's, that's exactly. kind of ludicrous. Yeah. 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 yeah, it is. But, it is. Well, my big, my big thing of the week, Fletch, you think it would be Liverpool defeating Tottenham to go 5-0, and uh, which brings you ever closer to singing the Jerry Lewis song. <laughs> But that's not it. That's not my big thing of the week. You think it's it's Pitt coming out and playing one of the great defensive games they've played against a team that has averaged 452 yards rushing against them in the last four years. But that's not it. That's not it at all. You'd think it'd be the Baltimore Orioles, who are going to be only the second team since the vaunted New York Yankees, or New York Mets in 1962, to finish under 300. <laughs> but that's not it. It's our prediction of weeks ago that Urban Meyer was going to throw his wife under the bus <laughs> on this whole uh, uh, episode yeah. at Ohio State. And I'm, I'm watching the Tom Rinaldi uh, uh, video um, that he did with ESPN yesterday, which if I'm an Ohio State person in charge of public relations and set up that interview, that person would be fired at this point in time uh, yeah. because Urban did not come out so well, especially with the fact that no, my wife never showed me those texts. She never showed me those pictures of which she said in the text that she was very afraid of the man um, herself. She never uh, mentioned this to him uh, over uh, over the years. So he, in fact, threw his – and Rinaldi was – I give the guy credit. He, I don't know if you saw the interview, but he was pretty no. relentless in, in, um, in, yeah, sure. in asking him this question. Do you mean this wife? And, and – Apparently, his wife has a big role in the program, um, so it's not just she's a a uh, quiet partner, so to speak. So um, he came across looking very bad, very bad, uh, almost stunningly bad, and and refused to admit, um, would never admit it the whole time why he got suspended. He just would say it was just because I didn't handle uh, a, a personnel matter with a coach well. That's why I got suspended. Came across horribly said he had no idea that the woman was blaming him for enabling this guy, even though it's been in the news pretty much nonstop for the last uh, uh, two or three months. Um, so uh, we were all spot on on that one, that uh, he would throw his wife under the bus. He did, in fact, throw his wife under the bus, and that is why the man has a job right now, because he's a pussy boy and threw his wife under the bus. And plenty of other contradictions, too, Dave, as well. He continues yeah. to make himself look like a complete fool here. Well, Smith yeah. Smith is a very good coach, and I had loyalty to, what is it, Trestle or whatever. Ah, yeah. it was a mistake in Hiram. Okay, so that's a complete reversal, okay? Right. I mean, yeah. two right. or three complete reversals, too. This guy's nothing but a phony, which is yeah. what somebody down in Florida told me, which is one of the reasons they unloaded him. You yeah. Know? yeah, they weren't sad to see him go, fellas. They, they were not sad to see him go. Yeah. They weren't. You're saying they, they are, they right. weren't. And they were not. Well, I mean, they won. I mean, we know the smelliness of these programs, so he won there. But the fact of the matter is some people in that administration got really tired of this guy's waffling on stuff there. And quite frankly, his deception. So, right. I mean, and that's proven and, to be correct. So, and, right. And Ohio State is obviously, in, in my opinion, you know, not being there, but in my opinion, has just come to grips with the fact they're going to be a less than ethical program. Um, they were just looking for whatever excuse, in my opinion, they were looking for whatever excuse they could to keep the man. Um, I mean, I even had a, uh, a devout Ohio State uh, uh, fan who uh, 
um, I've been going back and forth with about it. I told him to listen to listen to the show, and he basically came back and said, "Wow, that man shouldn't have a job." Um, I don't think so. I mean, but yeah. you know. hey, I, I, my prediction, I was wrong. I predicted he wouldn't survive, but you know, there you go. What do I know? Shouldn't have survived. I, I agree with you. He shouldn't have survived, but. Um, he did. I think the conference week. needs to come to Jesus. The biggest thing I see is the whole, if I'm running the Big Ten Conference, I just cannot believe that somebody who's a big provost of that conference, and I might do it on the QT because the way the media yeah. is today, yeah. would look at the blood on that conference over the last four or five years. I mean, it well, makes the old Miami oh. situation and Oklahoma situations look like choir boy stuff. Well, so, I mean, there's a difference between paying an athlete and – Turning your head towards rape and abuse. Yep. Um, yep. You know, and, and the NCAA choosing not really to investigate uh, Michigan State and and um, and saying saying they did what they should. Which well, I, you know, I think even, we all agree that the uh, NCAA stands for no cojones at all and, and stuff like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's I like that. I like that. That's good. But that's that's basically what it does. I mean, you you take aside the doctor, the good doctor, uh, and claiming they didn't know that. Take that aside. If you read what ESPN found out in their research about the doctor, of just things that the the football and basketball players had done on campus, which unspeakable crimes. Um, I, I just don't know how Izzo and and Donna Frio. A, didn't know what was going on, and, still. and he allowed it to happen. Um, I mean, I, you know, again, wasn't there, don't know, but I just find a tough time um, thinking that, that uh, they didn't know what was going on. And this, this my friends, is, is something that is so far beyond um, beyond paying players or, or, or doing the old-fashioned, you know, giving them fake grades. I mean... You know the wink, wink yeah. thing there isn't right, but you can deal with that. This stuff—that's my you know, view. This with. is my—that's my view, Dave. That's where I am. The whole conference smells like this whole conference smells like a toilet. So now well, it does, and and the stat of the week, and maybe this is this is retribution. This is the first time this past week um, since the Associated Press poll has been enacted in 1936 that the conference lost to seven unranked teams in one. Um, in wow. one week, and the T. If you look at them, they're they're not uh, Power Five teams. I mean, it was an embarrassing, embarrassing week for the Big Ten to boot, coupled with the Wisconsin loss, which is uh, you know uh, a team that uh, my claim that the Big Ten gets ranked teams because of reputation, not because they actually deserve to have ranked teams. Um, Ohio State being different, as they they. You know, in my estimation, recruit like an SEC school does. Um, but um, it, it just – there's just no excuse for what goes on there. And then the fans' reaction, um, and that still um, really gets to me that some of the fan reactions to Joe Paterno and, and just delusional uh, to, to what that guy actually was, that, that still just really – really bothers me. I'd love to root for a Pennsylvania team in the Big Ten, but that that just, you know, makes me not. I agree. Three of your signature names nationally have incredible blood or shit on their logo. Yeah. And yeah. if I'm running that conference, I'm saying, all right, we're all getting together. This is going to stop. You know what I mean? Sure. So yeah. that's yeah. what I would do, but that's me. So, yeah. and that's the, that would protect the money greater for longer, in my view. So, yeah, in yeah. my view. Yeah. So. Agreed. Oh, man. Well, we're on our predictions of the week. Mr. Fletcher, start us out. Well, mine's pretty evident. Uh, the Steelers will be making a change at the punting position. Uh, the only reason Jordan Berry survived the preseason punting duel is that Chris Boswell preferred him as a holder. And with uh, Boswell having his issue, maybe Barry isn't even doing that well. I will say this, you know, Barry did get lucky with one of his punts, that coffin corner one that led to the safety. But, you know, when he had the chance to pin the Chiefs to, at another crucial time, he finally, for the first time all game, connected one, and it sailed 10 yards out of the end zone. Unbelievably bad special teams, and he's got to go. And especially, you know, when Tomlin addresses it a couple of times, saying we need to look at it, 
that's not that's not good for your job security. No, no, no. And he's he's got to be frustrated at this point, and just ready to ready to make some in season moves if he needs to. And he, you know, plus he's Australian, and you know, the only Australian we should be really keep an eye on is a singer songwriter by the name of Michael Carpenter. Check him out, fellas. He's definitely worth listening to. Uh, and uh, that's is that the gentleman you uh, helped write the Christmas song with? I did. I did. I did co-write a little song with him. Very, and it was a very good one. Very entertaining one. Uh, kudos to you. You'll have to perform it for us, Fletch. I'm sure Carpenter's not going to come to you. Uh, well, you can see it on, on Facebook. Oh, oh, and there it goes. Yeah, yeah, oh. The shot, yeah. oh. Would you would you say that the punter is a busher? Oh, Literally I would say he's a – well, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, I, th- I think I understood what they were trying to do. I think they were trying to, you know, to try to kick it to the sidelines. Yeah. But, you know, it, guys, he hasn't punted well in, in two years. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Now he hasn't. And, you know, if you're keeping him because there's a comfort level as a holder, I mean, come on now. Yeah, and I agree. It's an important part of the game with all this offense, too. So, um, yep, I agree. Absolutely. Mr. Gary. I got a positive one and a negative one. All right. Okay. Uh, call me bitter, Fletch. I'll start with a positive. I actually think the Steelers are going to do a little better on Monday night uh, than people are giving them credit for and all of us are giving them credit for. I, I, this is not a good team. I'm not sure this team's going anywhere near the NFC, AFC title, like some mm-hmm. people said, for all the reasons we described. Nobody can tackle in the secondary and the linebackers. I mean, one of them should have been able to cover Kelsey a little better than that, too, by the way. But uh, in any event, uh, I, I think Tampa's a little overrated. I mean, New Orleans is a team that's got a lot of age. You pile up a lot of points. You know, uh, I, I honestly – and I, I'm still not sold on Fitzpatrick as, a, as an NFL quarterback. Got off to a good start. I think Pittsburgh's going to play a little bit better, and I think they might even get the victory down in Tampa on Monday, which will create some false hope perhaps. But that's my fearless, actually positive prediction. And I don't have a lot of basis in that other than the fact that I kind of think Roethlisberger played a little bit better on Sunday. I do think that receiving core is pretty damn good, particularly Washington, as you said, uh, Dave. I hope yeah. Brown settles down a little bit in his childishness. I mean, maybe he can get Connor the ball a little bit more. I actually think they're going to pull a little bit of an upset, perhaps, in some people's mind on Monday. I think they're going to play a little bit better overall game. I think that will be their best game of the year. On the negative hey, Gary, side, I, qu- question for you, though, before you get into that. When did Tampa Bay sign Conor McGregor to be their quarterback? that press conference? Up? He'd, like that. He'd, be, he'd be numbered. He'd, they'd be twins. You're right, Fletch. You're yeah. absolutely right about that. That was funny. That. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. I agree. That's a good yeah. – That's a that's what's that ESPN contest where they show, like, separated birth or whatever? Or yeah. The networks. That was pretty uh, You're funny. right, Fletch. I agree with you about that. Um, I just think he's a you know he's an average quarterback at best. Saw him a little bit with the Jets. I think they've had some things go right. I'm not sure they're as good as they look. I'm not sure even Winston was as good as people think, but I just have a feeling Steelers are going to play a little – Steelers generally play pretty well on – national TV games, Sunday nights and Mondays, too. That's just a gut yeah. deal that I have. On the negative side, I think my prediction is we're going to have every blowhard in the world talk about, you know, in boxing we had another controversy, and I don't want to ruin any, you know, we've probably all have seen the news. Uh, I don't think it's controversy at all. I just think the fighters, I don't think the fighters are all-time greats. I think the first one was very close, but we're going to hear all kinds of nonsense again. My buddies, Will Bond and Kornheiser, who I can't stand like you can't stand Madden, um, Fletch. I mean, all, all these nonsense people who have no idea what they're talking about are going to be talking about some big controversy. It's not a big controversy. It's not rigged for a third fight. The fighters are close. Neither one of them steps on the pedal enough. That's why we have what we have. I mean, the judges yeah. that were in that fight on Saturday were two good ones. Moretti and Weisfeld are very good. The third one I don't know so much about. I didn't see it yet. I'm looking forward to seeing it, but shut up. Just shut up, okay? I mean, I don't want to hear all this nonsense about how it's a rigged deck and all this other stuff. I mean, the reality is it's kind of everybody what everybody expected. So, I mean, that's my negative prediction. We're going to have to listen to this nonsense all week again from some people who have no idea what they're talking about, a business that they have no understanding of. So, sorry to be bitter, Fletch. Sorry to be negative, Dave, but... I'm not looking forward to all that nonsense. I'll probably just tune it out. 
and I love the bitterness. I love it. I, 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 know I, I embrace it, Jerry. Yeah, I embrace it, Fletch. I know you love the bitterness, Dave. What, you, do you agree with me, Fletch, or you disagree? I do. I do, 100%. Yep. Yep. 100%. So, yep. Well. Bring us home, Dave. I'm gonna I'm gonna have a a final baseball. The the number one team in Pittsburgh right now, record wise, the Pittsburgh Pirates. This is gonna be my prediction. They will if they sweep, they have to sweep the Kansas City Royals over the next three games. If they do that, they will finish five hundred. If they go two and one, they will not. I have trouble imagining this this team uh, uh, playing over 500 with Stallings at catcher and uh, Luplo in right field, um, who uh, I've heard people have differing thoughts about his potential as a major leaguer. My thought is he's maximum a, a number four guy um, who I classify personally as a quad A player. Um, and Stallings, I, I'm not even sure at this point why the hell they're playing Stallings at catcher because – He's to me a guy who, again, if if uh, you have three catchers out, you may bring him up to the majors. He's he's a good kid. He's a he's a good defensive player, but he just really has not much offense uh, um, behind him. So I, I have a tough time seeing them um, play above 500 if they don't if they don't sweep Kansas City. Um, and even with that. I think it comes down to that all-important game. That all-important game we're all looking forward to, and I'm sure you're coming down for Gary, on October 1st, Miami versus Pittsburgh in a makeup game um, to end the season. Pittsburgh plays October baseball, which I think I predicted earlier in the year that we'd be playing in October. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we will uh, we will be playing that day. We will uh, um, we will be playing uh, the Marlins in uh, just a titanic struggle. Um, we will have, uh, before that game, a contest. I don't know what the prize will be, but it will be pick the attendance um, uh, of that contest. Well, 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 here's the thing, Dave. Yeah. Jordan Lupo will get into the Hall of Fame. Once he pays his, his ticket, pays the fee at the, at the front desk, he will get into the Hall of Fame like any other person. I, 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 would, uh, I would think that's a solid prediction there. I will buckle to that one. But... Um, but that's that's my thing. They have to sweep Kansas City to have a chance, and I wish they would um, would be going a little harder after this. Um, because to me, from a business standpoint, a 500 or better team makes a whole lot uh, makes it a whole lot more easier to sell this for next year, especially with marketing. Um, yeah, I agree. With, with that that pitching staff that's developing there. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, but then that, that also forces them to have to go out and make a, make a couple of moves in the off season. So, absolutely. Know. I mean, you're you're going to have a couple contracts off your um, um, off off your books. You're you're going to have uh, probably after after the arbitration figures and such. You're probably going to have about um, ten or eleven uh, million left over to spend if you want to keep payroll where it was this year. Um, obviously, you can even make a more aggressive stance and, and go after somebody. But there are a lot of free agents out this year. This is, this is going to be a nice class. Obviously, they're not going to get the top of the line, but they have a, a chance to possibly get, um, you know, whether, whether you, you choose to, to uh, let Dickerson go to arbitration or sign another outfielder. Hell, you're probably getting McCutcheon for a million dollars at this point, as poorly as he's played. But. Uh, um, you know, do you, do you go with the all rookie infield of uh, of Newman and Kramer up the middle, or, or do you try to you know sign a uh, uh, quality uh, experienced uh, infielder to take one of the slots? I think Newman is pretty much um, in at shortstop, and I wouldn't mind Kramer. I think both of them have potential to to hit about the uh, in the 270 to 290 range. And they can both play defense, and, and Newman brings uh, brings a speed aspect to the game too. Um, and it's the so Seinfeld would, connection. I, don't don't forget the Seinfeld. You got, you got that too. You got that too. Absolutely. But um, you know, the Polanco thing's uh, a little worrisome. The Polanco thing's a little worrisome to me. I mean, he's a horrible sure. base runner, and he's half asleep like Herrera is here half the time. But he's supremely talented, and he's going to be out nine months. I mean, that's oh, a little God. worrisome. You know, Every time I look at that slide, you just wonder what that. I mean, a second grader doesn't slide in like that. Yeah. Just for 
for the life of me, I can't imagine what he was thinking. Well, I, I was surprised he slid at the right base. That was uh, <laughs> that's he represented progress that he was going in the right direction. Him and Herrera, yeah, it was it was horrible. Him and Herrera smoked the, the same guy. marijuana or drink the same Caribbean juice or something. They they both it doesn't make any sense. So Herrera sometimes here runs back to the wrong base. So yeah. I mean it's the same kind of thing. I agree, but I mean well, he is a force though, and he's a threat, and he's going to yeah. be out there a little while, and that hurts the lineup a little bit. So I think that might drive some some moves in the off. I still think the future is a lot brighter than it's been. Oh, I think it is too, and you, you got to figure you got to find a place for Adam Frazier. He's shown that. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yep. That he can well, hit the ball, and that's that's the place. Maybe his place is is uh, is in right field while he's out. I mean, he's not a great yeah. defensive player by any stretch. But you don't have to be in right field there. Exactly, and I would rather have the two better defensive players at second yep. and short in the rookies. Yeah. Um, you know, Frazier's not not horrific, but he he's by no stretch, um, he's by no stretch a, a, a top-notch uh, shortstop uh, um, or second baseman uh, defensively. But I like his bat in, and I think. And I think he could. He's not going to give you the power like Hernandez and Taylor do for the Dodgers, but he can play about four or five positions. You need a guy like that with these big bullpens. Yeah, you know? he did. Well, he's got and, and offensively, that's the one thing that hurts with this team. I mean, we we talked about earlier in the game, right? Early in the game, earlier in the show. Um, where all these guys had um, ha- had double uh, uh, or double digit home run power um, at every position. I mean, yep. we don't we don't we're not close to that. No. Um, but if you're not close to that, then get the better defense and and you know give these pitchers some more support out there uh, defensively. Um, yep. Yep. And I mean, bullpen sets up as a shutdown. I mean it. You know, you 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 find a way to muster up four or five runs a game. It could be a special year next year. Could be. I agree. But oh my. Then we'll, we'll have to debate whether they're better than the seventy-one or seventy-nine feet. Oh, wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't, wouldn't that, that be that a nice conversation to have? Wouldn't it be nice if they go to a World Series the same time as Duquesne finally makes an NCAA tournament? Yeah, I I, I don't see any of those things happening anytime, fellas. But you know, hey. Well, I agree with you on the World Series, street. but I can I'll guarantee street. you, I'm going to guarantee you, oh. next year, next year, not this year because of the freshmen, but with that talent that Dan Brod has, they will be in the NCAA tournament in 2020. The only way they will be is if they buy tickets. They're going to be, they're going to, they're going to charter a bus and they're going to go watch the nearest regional. We're putting something on this, my friend. We're putting something on this. I'm, I'm oh. Gonna, it might involve bacon, Dave. Tread, tread very carefully. Oh, uh, next show, you come up with something, and I'll come up with something. The two 2020 NCAA tournament they will be in. All right. I have one last right. question before we sign off. Yes. Are you guys going out and getting the supersized Starbucks cup of coffee to find some obscure app? to watch the game in Hawaii starting at 12.05 midnight. <laughs> Actually, I am working. I, I'm working the late shift on Saturday, so I will be getting home around midnight. Okay. And I, I plan on now, I'm going to pee too much at my age uh, in the middle of the night if I get the supersized Starbucks. So, you know, Viv gets a little frustrated at that if I, I keep getting up to have to pee. So, um, you know, I'm probably not going to get the coffee. But, uh I will. I will watch at least a half of it. Fletch. Oh, uh, I think I'm going to have to pass um, for the same reason that Dave said. You know, the uh, the plumbing's not what it used to be. So, <laughs> how's your plumbing, Gary? Perhaps let's I'll get it. Like, let's give it all. I'll, I'll get a, a, a I'm going to try my best. So, all right. will your plumbing be fine? Oh. <laughs> And on well, that, I think we've given our listeners uh, uh, much more than they expected. Yes. Yes, we have. Much more information than they expected. We always do, and that's why they like us. So that's why they like us. And, uh, you know, we won't have to bother on a prediction for the game, but no. Uh, but, hell, they're 3-1, and one and they play, play two people at their level kind of nice. So, uh, Valparaiso and Dayton and victory. So, you know, let them go 
uh, get their nice chunk of money in Hawaii. Uh, and uh, we'll come back and we'll get to the NCAA tournament in football, which we're going to do that too, Fletch, but I'm not going to bet anything on that. All right. All right. But figure it out next week, 2020, my friend. We're putting something you got together. it, man. All right. You got it. Gentlemen, you have a Bye. wonderful evening. We are adjourned. All right. Good night. Night. This has been a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production.